Here, and then we can get started.
Alrighty. Go ahead and kick things off. Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for taking time to join us today for an expert, expert panel discussing advancements in Edge AI. We'll hear from four key Canadian tech startups on the importance of Edge AI and how they're utilizing it within their businesses. We have a lot of great information to share with you today. So I'd like to begin by introducing you to our panelists. Robal Lala is the CEO of Fluent AI, a voice recognition solutions company that created fully offline embedded technology. Prior to this position, Lala has been an active angel investor for the past 12 years as the chair of the Maple Leafs Angel, the Maple Leaf Angels Corporation, excuse me. At Fluent, Lala helps pro propel company growth and leverage its range of artificial intelligence voice interface software products to offer up to OEMs and service providers. Next is Sheldon Fernandez, who is the CEO of Darwin AI, a seasoned executive and respective thought leader who applies emerging AI technologies to the enterprise. Since 2017, Sheldon has led Darwin AI to enable enterprises to build trustworthy AI. Through his career, Sheldon has coupled his entrepreneurial endeavors with non-technical pursuits resulting in an interdisciplinary approach that is critical to the intelligent application of AI. Nick Romano is CEO of DeepLight, a Canadian AI software company dedicated to enabling AI for everyday life. Nick is a serial entrepreneur delivering successful outcomes through leadership, integrity, innovation, and empowerment for over 20 years. Prior to DeepLight, Nick was co-founder and CEO of several successful Canadian tech companies, including MessagePoint, PreNova Software, and PreNova Technologies. Finally, we have Kareem Ali, who is the founder and CEO of Envision AI. Kareem has over 10 years experience in the commercial application of machine learning and computer vision. He led development teams at Accenture and CSEM, where he managed, developed, and delivered computer vision solution software to major multinational corporations. Now that we have introductions out of the way, let's get started. First up, we have Probal Lala, CEO of Fluent AI. Media in attendance, please feel free to send in your questions at any point during the presentation using the Q&A feature on Zoom. We'll pause between each speaker to address your inquiries. Probal, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Laurel. And uh, boy, I love that uh, intro music. I got to tell you, uh, it felt like I was back pre-pandemic and being able to go to a spa. <laughs> um, so thank you all for attending today. I just uh, recently finished up um, Douglas Adams' book, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and it actually got me thinking about uh, the talk today. In particular, I was just wondering if I were in the 1700s and describing to people that we would uh, one day have machines that could fly between planets. And in fact, we could converse with these machines. I think they'd think we were crazy, yet here we are. We're in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution right now uh, that's been enabled by the internet and that's really giving us instantaneous access to vast amounts of data. This actually coupled with massively parallel computing in the cloud has enabled a narrow version of artificial intelligence that allows for us to uh, predict trends and actually solve very, very complex problems that uh, previously were only solved by organic computers. So on your right, um, you can pick your favorite digital assistant that can now answer nuanced questions, or frankly, like uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, put a babble fish in your ear and translate any language. You can have your favorite navigation app that will not only get you to your destination, but predict uh, traffic jams. In fact, you can be in a car that's now self-driving or close to it. And more recently, we have computers that are actually predicting the uh, uh, occurrences of certain diseases. Now, the next evolution or revolution, and I'll leave it to the economists and the technologists in the room to debate whether it's evolutionary or revolutionary, is the miniaturization of machine learning into very small hardware, where we've combined artificial intelligence with connected devices 
to make truly smart devices. Now these embedded devices or these intelligent devices rather are in very, very small footprint uh, arenas operating totally offline and with low latency. What that means from an end user perspective is that you can now have a battery operated device and the battery lasts a very long time. Because you are no longer connected to the internet, your devices can be always on and always available. But with the proviso that because it's not connected to the internet, these are mostly private and secure. Finally, as we've eliminated that round trip delay to the internet and back, the devices are much more responsive and some would argue intuitive in how we interact with these devices. So what Edge AI has actually done is brought the smart into smart watches, the smart into smart appliances, and the smart into smart factories. At Fluent AI, we voice enable the world's devices, and we do so by using Edge AI. Um, a recent stat put out by Statista indicated that the three barriers for original equipment manufacturers to actually voice enable their devices were the top three barriers were um, accuracy of, of command recognition, the ability to actually recognize different accents, and finally, the cost of uh, implementing voice recognition in their devices. At Fluent, we actually provide very low cost embedded software. We're highly robust and we can operate in any language and in any accent. So how do we do this? The traditional voice recognition world that's uh, related in the bottom half of this slide goes from voice to text, text to cloud, cloud to natural language processing, and then to intent. We bypass most of those steps and we go directly from acoustic to action. By doing so, we can create very small embedded offline my, uh, uh, software modules that are private by design. Because we don't have to transcribe uh, from speech to text, we're highly accurate and noise robust. And finally, an acoustic only model makes us language agnostic and accent agnostic. Our product is currently being embedded into a number of very large OEM devices. However, none of them have launched and I don't want to take away their thunder by pre-announcing any of those, those uh, deployments or soon to come deployments. However, seeing is believing. So what I can show you is a demonstration of our software on a very small embedded device. Uh, the, the example that we'll show it operates in three different languages um, and has uh, 11 commands and has two totally offline wake words, uh, computer and Alexa. Have a listen. Computer, hello. Now change screen red in Mandarin. Alexa, now make screen blue in Korean. Computer, 화면 파란색으로 바꿔. Alexa, start flashing the screen. Now stop flashing in Mandarin. Computer, 停闪. Now make screen yellow in Korean. Alexa, 노란색 화면으로 변경. Computer, change color to green. Now, what time is it in Korean? Computer, 지금 몇 시? Alexa, goodbye. And there you have it, Edge AI in action. Any questions? Thanks so much, Proval. Um, we do have a couple questions trickling in here. So um, first off, I uh, would love for you to dive in a little bit deeper to the benefits of low latency AI products specifically for the end user. So it really is about a natural interaction. In fact, the demo that I showed you, we, uh, we won a, uh, or got an innovation recognition at CES 2020. We took that device on the, uh, the uh, show floor, which is very loud. And we demoed the product and I thought people would be surprised by the languages, but what people were really impressed by is actually the low latency. The fact that you're naturally interacting with a device. One of our OEM clients that's embedding the product right now took me into their boardroom to show me my product and basically uh, showed us a 
traditional voice assistants and said, voice assistant, turn on the light, two, three, four, and the lights went on. And then took our product and said, fluent, turn on the light, and the lights immediately went on. And this is a product person who, who said, this is how people want to interact with their devices, better than human. Absolutely, that's a perfect case study, I think. Another question that we have coming in here. Um, so why is edge AI beneficial to Fluent's unique speech to intent AI model? Um, so given the fact that we actually go directly from acoustic to action, most AI models uh, are fairly large, although we, we have some great companies here that, that can shrink these models in. Are by the very nature of how we implement voice recognition, it actually lends itself to very, very small, accurate models. And as I said, language and accent agnostic. Absolutely. I think that's all the questions that we have for uh, you at the moment, ProBall. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we are going to have Sheldon Fernandez, who is the CEO of Darwin AI. And I will let you take it away, Sheldon. Hey, thank you very much, Laurel, and uh, appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, so uh, as mentioned, I'm Sheldon Fernandez, the CEO of Darwin AI. And just by way of background, uh, we are a four-year-old artificial intelligence company based out of Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, we are organically connected to the University of Waterloo. So two of our co-founders are professors at that institution, including Professor Alexander Wong, who's Canada's research chair in artificial intelligence. Uh, our team has been working on foundational AI related to edge AI for a number of years. Uh, most recently, we were named by CB Insights on the AI 100 list, which is a pretty popular um, you know, designation for artificial intelligence companies in the world. Uh, we were one of five companies in Canada that were named to that list, and I believe the only one that was on the list prior in 2020. Uh, so our vision at Darwin is to enable enterprises to build AI at the edge that they can trust. And that last qualifier is really important for us because it's not just about building efficient AI or functional AI, but about building transparent and trustworthy AI, which is increasingly becoming uh, a concern uh, in light of govern government regulations, uh, other regulatory bodies and so forth. Uh, in the past year, we've announced some high profile partnerships, for example, with Lockheed Martin and Honeywell Aerospace. But to illustrate the uh, promise of Edge AI, I actually wanna illustrate a very inventive and unique project that we're involved with that involves the topic of food security. So in 2013, a group of MBA students from McGill University won the 2013 Halt Prize, which is sort of like the uh, Nobel Prize for MBAs. And it's a million dollar prize given out by the Clinton Global Foundation. And this team's idea was to leverage the unique biological properties of crickets to address the long-term food security challenges of our planet. And based on their exhaustive analysis, they concluded that the amount of energy it takes to grow crickets versus the amount of protein they produce makes it one of the most attractive organisms to mine uh, from a food security perspective. And so their vision was to construct a next generation facility to grow these crickets in a very efficient manner and to use them uh, for food purposes. Now, of course, in this part of the world, eating an insect live is a bit unusual for us. Of course, it's very common in other parts of the world, but if you think of things like uh, protein bars and so forth, suddenly the idea doesn't become so uh, you know, problematic. And so the construction of this facility has already begun and they're hoping that it'll be an example for other facilities around the world. We are basically uh, implementing the AI portion of this entire workflow. Now you might ask yourself, what does AI at the edge have to do with growing crickets? Well, if you think about things like humidity, temperature, and looking at the actual uh, biological properties in real time, their skin color, uh, their weight ratio, their height and so forth, what you can in fact implement is a very sophisticated system whereby you are controlling the environment in real time so as to maximize cricket yield. Now, one of the challenges with dealing with live organisms in this context is what we call negative data. And so AI needs a lot of data to run um, or to learn rather, but how do I do that? How do I get an example of a sick cricket or a malnourished cricket 
if I don't have them and I don't want to manufacture them because of ethical uh, challenges. So we have very unique technology which implements synthetic data to this end. And the plan is to outfit the entire facility with many, many sensors and cameras and do this analysis in, analysis in real time at the edge so as to implement a next generation facility and address the problem of food security. So very topical and some would say humanitarian example of AI at the edge. Now, another aspect of our offering that is increasingly important from a commercial point of view is explainable AI at the edge. So you will often hear that artificial intelligence is a black box, which essentially means that even the designers of these systems don't know how they reach their conclusions. And as we've seen in the past couple of months, uh, bodies like the European Union and you know, Bill C-11 here in Canada are starting to put in very stringent requirements around the transparency that is required of artificial intelligence systems. And it's not enough to do explainability when you design the system. What is now being asked is to give you explainability while you use the system in real time. A very topical example of that uh, actually has to do with a system we designed about 18 months ago in light of the pandemic that was developing at the time. So when Corona became particularly acute in Canada, our team, along with researchers at the University of Waterloo, very quickly created a neural network called COVIDnet that diagnoses Corona based on chest x-rays and CT scans. And we open sourced this model, we gave it to the community, and the response amazed us. We had hundreds of researchers around the world contributing to the product, and it is now being used in about a, uh, two dozen hospitals around the world, from India to Italy to Australia to Malaysia. Now, a key thing here is that you need to be able to surface to a non-technical user, in this case, a radiologist or a clinician, why the AI is doing what it's doing. Why is, does it think this particular image or CT scan of a person's lungs uh, is a positive COVID diagnosis? And so where explainability of the AI is particularly powerful is when you have a human in the loop that is required to, in some important sense, validate the AI decision-making process. So this was a non-commercial effort. We didn't want to profit on this in light of what was happening around the world, but we have now taken this concept and we have applied it commercially. Uh, one of the biggest areas is in manufacturing. If you think of things like quality inspection or parts detection, uh, AI is very, very good at looking at a lot of data and determining irregularities or anomalies. But again, it's a human being that in some important sense needs to fuse that understanding with their own intuition. And it is in this area that we've been able to generate quite a bit of commercial traction uh, for our aerospace and automotive clients. So with that, I would like to thank you and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Sheldon. Uh, I have a couple questions here for you right off the bat. Um, I love the case study about the crickets. Um, I think that's just such a wonderful, uh, the applications of that really um, are very impactful. So um, would love to hear a little more if you can elaborate on the process of how you guys crafted that synthetic data um, and you know what kind of went into that. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, so how do you, for example, uh, manufacture an example of, uh, of a malnourished cricket? Um, what you actually do is you take examples from the literature and then you in, in some technical way generate variations of that. Uh, so it approximates what the system would see in the real world in, in, in real life. Uh, and by doing that and having enough variation, you can teach the AI to recognize the real thing. Wow. I imagine that that's going to have some profound impacts even beyond just that use case. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you think about not just insects, but all the different areas where uh, we could use artificial intelligence in the natural world, um, you know, that type of capability is gonna be uh, increasingly important. Yeah, absolutely. Another question we have um, was to your point of explainable AI. So, you know, wondering if you feel that we're really going to see that approach rise in popularity, um, especially given some of the examples that you shared with us. Uh, absolutely, I think you will. Um, and so there, there's two elements to this. There's explainability, which is uh, telling you how something works and, you know, why it does what it does. But then there's trustworthiness, which is when and where does it fail? And that is also becoming increasingly important. Um, and what we're finding regulatory bodies are starting to say to a lot of companies that are doing work in this field, if you are gonna use AI in a self-driving car, for example, or to determine somebody's mortgage, it is your responsibility to explain 
how it reaches that decision and when and where it'll fail or what the boundaries are. Uh, so we've seen this with GDPR in Europe. We're seeing this now, the legislation. I was talking to actually members of parliament about the nuances of that legislation. So absolutely, I think it's gonna be an increasing topic uh, to the successful adoption of, of artificial intelligence. Absolutely, thank you. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have for you for now, Sheldon. Thank you so much. Um, as a reminder uh, to any media that may have jumped in a little bit late here, uh, you're more than welcome to send in any questions you have throughout the presentations. And we'll do a quick pause after each panelist to field those questions. So next up, we have Nick Romano, who is the CEO of Deep Light AI. I will let you take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you everybody for spending the time with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Romano. I am the uh, CEO and co-founder of Deep Light and we create AI for everyday life. Uh, so we've had a, lot, a, new, a couple of uh, presentations now talking about AI at the edge. So I, I think from a definition perspective, you're kind of getting the, the hang of what we're talking about here. It's really sort of that interface point where AI is uh, interfacing with the real world uh, and lots of different types of use cases associated with that. Um, we believe fundamentally that edge is gonna be bigger than the cloud. Uh, when we talk about billions of devices uh, with even more billions of microprocessors, sensors and controllers within those devices uh, with 5G networks coming online so that these devices can talk to each other uh, and literally zettabytes of data uh, that's available for these devices to process. If we can process that data locally uh, at the point of data capture, uh, that's truly when AI is gonna become untethered, decentralized uh, and everywhere, really an ubiquitous uh, part of our lives. But one of the biggest challenges uh, with uh, AI and, and deep neural networks in particular uh, is that they're slow uh, and they're big. Uh, so they require a tremendous amount of compute power, a lot of memory, uh, and from a, and particularly when it comes to battery operated devices, they can consume uh, a tremendous amount of power. These are all challenges uh, to enabling uh, AI to run uh, at the edge uh, on their own. So if you're going to have effective AI at the edge, what do you need to do? Well, you need to do two things. You need to make them smaller uh, and you need to make them faster. Uh, and you need to do that without compromising the original accuracy of your AI. The accuracy of that decision making process should not be compromised. Uh, by any optimizations efforts to get uh, AI uh, at the edge. Uh, and that's what DeepLight does. So we've got this automated process where we use AI to make other AI smaller, faster, uh, and more energy efficient for the edge. And we do that through our hardware agnostic software acceleration platform, which is comprised of two components. DeepLight Neutrino is this automated engine that we use to make AI very, very small. Uh, so we can take very large models, run them through our engine and create um, very small kilobyte size type AI models that do the exact same thing that the large model did. And we also have Deep Light RT, which is our runtime engine. And we use this engine to run that tiny AI very, very fast. And we do this all without compromising the accuracy of that original model. So a couple of examples here. So this is a project we did with BlackBerry QNX. This is within their real-time operating system. On the left-hand side of this video was the original uh, um, vehicle detection model that was running within the QNX platform. Uh, and then on the right-hand side is the optimized version that's been run through uh, the Deep Light platform. So you can see here, uh, basically a 3X speed up uh, on this model and also an, a significant increase uh, in terms of performance from a battery consumption perspective. So when we talk about car detection or basically anything with respect to latency, you know, if you can speed up the decision-making process, you increase the reaction time uh, of whatever your use case is. And in the case of a, an autonomous vehicle, it's a pretty big, pretty important thing. And another really interesting example here, this is a local Canadian company called eSmart. So they've got this third-party assisted driving platform that they retrofit into trucks. So they sell into trucking companies and fleets. Uh, their current uh, version of speed detection is GPS-based. Uh, which was problematic when these trucks were going through places like construction zones, et cetera, where uh, the, the, the speed limit was dynamically changing. Uh, so they wanted to implement uh, an AI-enabled uh, uh, speed detection process, which we're helping them do. But because this is a company that already has thousands of units out in the field, they couldn't just rip out hardware uh, and increase the, 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 com com the compute power of these devices in order to handle the AI. So we had to fit the AI into this constrained environment uh, of their existing deployments. So that's where DeepLight came in, optimizing the models, not just so that you can fit 
your speed detection model on the pre-existing constrained chip, but also leave enough room for future uh, AI models to be deployed uh, into that platform. This is really interesting, particularly in the context of the situation with semiconductor chips today, uh, where you know supply is a big issue. Being able to leverage your existing hardware is a huge value add uh, for AI. Uh, last example here, this is smart manufacturing, kind of similar to, to the case that Sheldon was describing. Uh, in this case, uh, they needed to get the model that was looking for these defects onto a camera that only had 256 kilobytes of on-chip memory. So the original model was almost 13 megabytes in size. Uh, and with our platform, we were able to get it down to 144 kilobytes, well within uh, the memory constraints of that particular camera. So now that model can run locally on that camera uh, and make the decisions uh, almost instantly. Uh, really interesting uh, times for us. We just closed a 6 million series seed round last month led by PJC. Uh, and this uh, great list of other investors that joined the syndicate. So we're uh, very excited about the next phase of our growth. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm Nick Romano, CEO of DeepLight, and we create AI for everyday life. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nick. We'll go ahead and open it up for questions. So first one out of the gate for you, uh, you know, you really emphasized, uh, you know, not compromising accuracy. So yeah. what are some of those processes that you guys take to, or the steps you take to ensure that accu accuracy is not compromised um, throughout, you know, testing and creating these models? Sure. So uh, the, 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 the key foundational element for us is because we are a tool uh, for groups that have typically created their own their model already. So they've already trained it for accuracy. In fact, we often advocate uh, our customers not worry about size and speed at this point, but just focus on the accuracy of the model uh, and we'll take care of the rest. So uh, you know, you've, so you've got your pre-trained model and you've trained it for accuracy, but maybe now it's too big, maybe it's too slow, it's consuming too much power. Uh, that's where we come in. And we, they basically, the user, uh, because we've got this automated process, all they need to do is specify what their design constraints are. What are the, what are the desired uh, look and feel of that model is uh, post-optimization. Uh, and then that's where our algorithm comes in. So basically, we've got a process of searching that original, what we call the teacher model, uh, and that teacher model, we explore that design space and we find the appropriate, what we call student model uh, that satisfies those design constraints. So there's actually a training process that goes on where the teacher trains the student uh, and the new model that comes out is a model that does essentially what the teacher model does, but in a form factor that you are looking for in terms of size, speed, et cetera. Awesome, yeah, that, uh, that's fantastic. I think that's super important. So another question, um, I know you brought, came up with a couple um, examples, for, particularly in transportation from the BlackBerry mm -hmm. example to the trucking. Um, are there any other applications of your technology um, within transportation or otherwise um, that are kind of coming down the pipeline? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, we're, our focus right now is computer vision and in general. Uh, so we're working with uh, security companies uh, right now. So we've got one company that we're working with uh, they've got residential and business uh, security subscriptions, basically. It's like home security, like your home alarm system, for example. Uh, and they do a tremendous amount of processing in the cloud, particularly of video capture for cameras. Uh, so what we're doing for them is we're enabling AI within those cameras. Uh, first, their existing cameras, kind of like that, that eSmart example where we had to deploy within their existing hardware, but also their new next generation of cameras that are coming out. And the idea is to process locally and only transmit uh, information that's relevant, that makes sense. So you reduce uh, tremendously the amount of compute that's required in the cloud to process essentially useless data uh, and only send the important stuff. Uh, so that's one example. We're working with a toy company, uh, a very large toy company actually, where they're, they're, they're looking to deploy um, apps on phones and tablets. So it's immersive play. Uh, so they're using the camera on the phone or the tablet with the toys that they create. Uh, to create an immersive experience for uh, whoever's playing with the, with the toy at the time. So there's lots of different use cases, manufacturing, mobility, and mobility isn't just outside the vehicle. Like I use the example of car detection, but there's lots of AI that's coming to market within the cabin uh, of the vehicle as well. You know, uh, attention detection, whether you're, you know, nodding off, falling asleep, that sort of thing, temperature control, comfort, uh, sound. There's lots of really interesting use cases uh, in AI in a lot of different areas, but computer vision is our specialty. 
uh, and we're in a number of different uh, verticals as a result. That's fantastic. Sounds like lots of exciting things coming down the pipeline between your, your round of funding and some great partnerships. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nick. We'll go ahead and uh, pass it to now Kareem Ali, who is the CEO and founder of Envision AI. I will let you take it away, Kareem. Okay, um, thank you. Laurel, let me, let me just make sure I'm sharing properly here. Uh, hopefully everyone's seeing my screen. So thanks everyone for, for your time today. It's really a, a pleasure to hear um, all the progress uh, that, that you know, the previous uh, companies who presented have made. It's a testament to the strength um, uh, of the AI ecosystem in Canada. All of these companies are truly you know, working on foundational uh, technologies here. So uh, my name is Kareem Ali. I'm the founder and CEO of Envision. Uh, we are enabling the next next generation artificial intelligence. So we heard a lot about edge AI, and uh, I don't want to go over a lot of that, but maybe present some of the things from a, diff a slightly different perspective. Uh, so an interesting statistic that you may have heard, um, <clears throat> if you look at all of the data that exists in the world today, 90% of that data was generated in the past year alone. So this really statistic is, 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 is overwhelmingly showing you that we're generating data at exponentially increasing rates. Now, majority of that data gets generated at the edge, meaning on sensors that are out there on the field. And conventional AI, as you've heard uh, already, still requires data to be pushed to the cloud and analyzed there. Um, this is especially true when you're dealing with uh, visual signals like camera, uh, radar, and LIDAR. So, as a company, we were founded on the idea, again, that Edge AI is really uh, where you want to be. Uh, this is where, where, where the puck is going. Um, a lot of people tell us, well, better networks, like won't better networks like 5G or 6G solve, solve that problem? That you, know, you, you, can, you can push all the data to the cloud. Uh, you'll have all the connectivity that you need. So the reality is, as we move forward into the future, um, you know, uh, we'll be deploying more and more sensors. And each year, these sensors are improving and generating even more data. So cameras are moving from VGA 10 frames per second to HD 30 frames per second to 4K 60 frames per second. You see that across, across the board. So our ability to generate data far outpaces our, our improvement in, in transmitting it over the air or, or otherwise. There's more safety critical applications that are, that are, that are coming online where basically availability, availability and latency uh, uh, are paramount importance. And also there's a big question uh, of privacy. So all of this really motivates why AI uh, needs to, in order to scale, really needs to run uh, at the edge. Um, I like to show this, it's a little bit of a history uh, lesson. Maybe you'll be able to guess how old I am uh, through the slide, but uh, it kind of shows the progress of AI, uh, particularly computer vision, specifically object detection uh, over the past years. So um, some of you hopefully are old enough to remember uh, the first consumer grade cameras that came out in 2001 that had face detection uh, feature enabled. So that was actually the absolute first application of machine learning or AI uh, to a consumer product. Uh, worked fairly well, uh, not, not that well actually, but it was very fast. That even at the time you could embed it into a consumer grade camera. So that was 20 years ago. Um, a few years later, we're talking about seven or eight years later, uh, Mercedes started coming up with the first examples of people detection. Uh, for to automate braking, you know, in their in their luxury cars. So um, that was a few years later, much more accurate system that could achieve 50% accuracy, but it was a hundred times slower. Uh, fast forward to 2017, 2018, uh, it was just about the time I was finishing my uh, my postdoc uh, at UC Berkeley, and we started hearing about deep learning. So uh, again, we went from 50% accuracy to 98% accuracy overnight. Uh, but the cost that we paid was this, again, much, much slower, much bigger networks, much slower, as, as Nick was saying. So this has been the trend over the years. A lot of people talk about a revolution, up to you to decide if it is. Um, but really, we've been achieving much higher accuracy by, by, by throwing more computers at the problem, more compute power, more hardware. Uh, and we're operating in an area where, you know, we're looking for a sweet spot. Uh, and that's what Edge AI is and enables deployment on, on field sensors. So Envision, uh, 
very much focus on uh, visual signals, camera, radar, LIDAR. We can do things like detecting objects, people, vehicles, classifying vehicles into car, bus, truck, tracking them through the field of view of the sensor. Our focus is, again, ultra efficient neural networks and computer vision methods that can run on low power devices. Uh, big distinguishing feature uh, about Envision is our ability to extract 3D situational awareness from these sensors. So for example, when we detect in a, in a camera image a person, we don't just say a person in pixel 100. Uh, we can actually tell you the GPS coordinates of, of that person. We can place them on a map, say the latitude is X, longitude is Y. We can have many cameras working together uh, in coordination. So as, 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 a, as a vehicle, let's say, is moving through an intersection, uh, it's being tracked uh, from camera to camera uh, to camera. All of this runs at the edge for us. And it's a platform that we've been building uh, over, over the past uh, four years. Um, and what we've been doing is essentially leveraging that platform uh, to target very specific uh, full stack applications in, in three big verticals. And I'll, and I'll show you three examples of this. So really our approach and model, we, we, our platform is internal to, to our company. Uh, and what we build uh, is full stack solutions um, that solve, solve, solve big problems. So uh, first big solution we have is on vehicle occupancy detection. So a lot of interest uh, worldwide automating um, uh, the enforcement of priority lanes. So we've built a system that combines camera and LIDAR and as cars are moving at highway speeds, we're able to tell you how many people are inside the vehicle. Uh, we just came back from tests in Washington DC. We've got a unit uh, up and running in, in Israel. Uh, we've shown essentially 99.7% accuracy compared to some of the competing companies who are uh, at around 70, 80% accuracy. Uh, we have big partnerships with Siemens, Transurban, uh, which is a multinational road operator and, and Raytheon. Um, another product that we're developing has to do with 5G towers and optimizing the performance of 5G towers, which are very sensitive to the dynamic environment. Uh, so it's, for a tower, it's a 5G tower, it's really important to understand where vehicles might be, where people are, because all of these, uh, op these are obstacles that impact signal propagation. So this is a multi-camera system uh, that we're building, which takes from, from normal cameras, can give you this 3D situational awareness. It's all low latency, it's all running uh, at the edge, close to the tower. So uh, final example uh, of a final product that we're building uh, is a forward collision warning system that we're building in, together with Talus. We just mounted uh, the prototype on, on a Metrolink Go train uh, here in Toronto. Uh, so this is a camera and radar system that looks ahead of the train, detects objects and warns the driver of a possible collision. So uh, explainability here is critical for us. Uh, safety integrity for rail is, is even more strict than, than an automotive. So it's really important to know what you're detecting, know the confidence of your detections um, and understand where, where things uh, might go wrong. Uh, that's it for, for us. So I'm happy to take any, any, any questions now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Kareem. Um, yeah, first question, I think coming in here, um, kind of at the end there, you touched a little bit on the um, train safety, I believe. Uh, can you expand a little bit more on how uh, your solution helps with that, those safety protocols? Yeah, so really it, it comes down to like our, our approach to safety integrity uh, together with our partner Talos is, is really about having multi-chain architectures uh, running in parallel. So. Um, so you always have kind of fail safes. So uh, let's say the, the, the system has two cameras, a radar and, and a LIDAR. Um, if a sensor fails, like the question is like, how, how does your architecture adapt to that, right? It, it, it can very happen, easily happen that like a camera shuts down. Uh, and now you're left with one camera, a LIDAR and a radar instead of two cameras. Uh, so it's, it's about building uh, all of these contingencies uh, in, into your architecture. Um, and that, that's really how, how we approach the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I think another thing that would be interesting to explore, you know, how with so much data out there, um, you know, how can AI at the edge kind of translate into a cost savings? Because you really are kind of cutting out some of that unnecessary information. Yeah, no, it's, I, I mean, it's huge, right? I mean, it's uh, instead of sending raw camera signals, I mean, if, if you know, you're talking about ter going from instead of having to transmit terabytes of data so that you can analyze, you know, especially when you're talking about camera and LIDAR and radar, 
uh, you're now sending kilobytes, right? So cost savings are, it, it really very much, is very much driven by the application are, are, are tremendous. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's part of it. Um, the, the other thing is, it, and it's really about scalability, right? Like even 5G, you, you can't guarantee internet connections everywhere and you can't guarantee them all the time. Uh, so really the only way to stick AI can scale is at the edge. And it's great to see, you know, four, four companies who are uh, come to that realization and dedicated to, to, to that revolution. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Kareem. Um, so that does conclude all of our panelists' presentations. And um, we do have a couple of questions for the larger group. So um, I'll open it back up to invite everybody to come back on camera um, and we can do a couple of larger questions here now. So um, the first one, um, we'd love to hear, um, you know, we can open it up to the whoever would like to go first, but I'd love to hear a little bit more on whether you foresee edge AI starting to replace cloud-based AI in the years to come um, and then why or why not? Um, I, can, I can start, uh, you know, in, it, it, there, there's a role for cloud uh, in, in AI. There's no question about it. Um, and some applications, you know, lend themselves to it. Uh, but generally speaking, yeah, I believe uh, that uh, particularly in day-to-day -day, uh, activities, you're going to see a lot more uh, of that processing happening locally. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, we talked about some of them like speed, like latency. Uh, privacy is probably the biggest one, uh, at least in my mind, uh, particularly when you're interacting uh, with individuals uh, and not, you know, wanting to, you know, send information about what your activities and what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think uh, so I think it's going to be a function of the technology, uh, but also a function of regulation uh, that's going to drive uh, a lot of that processing out of the cloud and into the edge devices themselves. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, I also say it's, it's not a binary choice. Um, and, yeah, yeah you know, exactly. When, when, when people have a topic, they, they, they think, you know, they, they pit one against the other. Um, you know, I think in situations where you need an incredible amount of horsepower for the machine learning task at hand, I'm thinking, you know, I just came across the use case of uh, analyzing, you know, particle acceleration and, you know, billions and billions of mathematical calculations. Well, of course, you're going to do that in the cloud, given the horsepower you need. Uh, but Nick makes a very important point that privacy and the regulatory pressure that we're feeling means you want to do a lot of stuff at the edge related to security, related to, you know, taking the biomedical sensitive information of an individual. So there's a role for both, but I think what we're seeing is the more pronounced implementation of edge AI, which I think, you know, all, all my fellow presenters made, made that case pretty, pretty compellingly. Maybe if I just would build on that slightly is another element of if you split AI into two aspects where you train models and then you have an inference or, or actually implement models. I think the implementation is clearly going towards the edge for privacy reasons, latency reasons, et cetera, with some exception or use cases that, that are in the cloud. But a lot of the training, which requires terabytes, uh, zettabytes of data um, will still be in the cloud. Although as uh, following something similar to Moore's law, I'm not certain if it's been renamed, but as you have uh, neural uh, processing units or, or compute power increase significantly and AI-based chips, there may be also more of a shift in, into the edge. Awesome, thank you so much, guys. I think that kind of lends itself to um, the next question that we had here of just whether AI on the edge was going to be the answer to this rising consumer demand for privacy. Um, I think we've really seen a big push from people calling for their devices to not be listening in, to not be storing their data. There's a lot of concerns uh, out there right now. Yeah, I think we've all had those disturbing moments where you look at your phone and there's an ad for something you were just talking about a couple of minutes before. Um, so yeah, I think people will become more comfortable uh, with AI. And in fact, that's when it will really become a, bit, a lot more ubiquitous in what we do every day. Uh, when we feel comfortable that, you know, we're not sending our day-to-day -day activities to some, uh, some analytics process, trying to figure out what, what it is that we're doing uh, and then having them sell that data to somebody else. 
So I think definitely to to, to next point, the uh, the creepiness of, uh, of of AI has has become quite real nowadays. Edge AI will definitely enable, I think, uh, the ability for privacy and security. But I think this has to actually be combined with corporations who are Im- implementing edge or cloud-based AI with policies that are more transparent and give uh, the public the ability to know what can or can't be translated and maybe default to uh, a situation where it's privacy on and let the public determine what gets sent to the cloud or, or shared. But uh, I think it will be certainly enabled by Edge AI, but it, it, it requires policy and social um, uh, governance <laughs> in, in how we implement AI. Yeah, for, from our perspective, like every single customer we're dealing with uh, either they approach us because of privacy and that, that is like top of mind, like it's in the top, top two or three and um, um, either, yeah, either they're approaching it because of that or, or, or it's a, you know, a very, very high priority uh, for them. Uh, but when we look at all of our products, like they are sensitive, like our vehicle occupancy detection, we're taking pictures of people inside their cars uh, on the highway. Nobody wants to send that to the cloud. Uh, so the fact that we can run all of the analysis on the unit itself and just e- extract the count um, that that really uh, that helps uh, you know transportation authorities and and you know private road operators to to implement these these kinds of technologies. Absolutely, thanks, guys. Next question here, um, likely uh, our final one. Um, so, wondering what are some of the shortcomings of edge AI today, um, and you know what do you kind of see coming down the pipeline to address these, or if you have any examples of uh, what your companies are doing to address them today? I guess I'll start. The shortcoming would be again an element that I alluded to earlier that. When training AI models, it requires either massive amounts of data or, or compute power, and then you can shrink them. So currently, the compute power just isn't there to, to train models and, and so have models that uh, change over time, uh, which, which does happen in the cloud. We, the, the models learn to learn. Um, but there is some incremental aspect of that that it, we certainly are looking at implementing in our edge-based devices. But uh, some workarounds to that are over-the-air updates that allow models to get sort of reflashed as as more data comes available, and with permission, providing metadata to the cloud to to improve efficiency or or performance of of uh, of such devices. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, you know, one of the challenges when you deploy AI is something we term model drift, which is over time it'll just become inefficient at the task at hand given variations that we have in the real world. And so we're developing like monitoring technology to monitor that drift. But if you need that technology to run at the edge per per Paul's point, it requires more compute. So how do you do something like anomaly detection, you know, or something that is outside the boundaries of inference, but you need that at the edge. Uh, And so one of the areas that we're exploring, actually it's it's a academic collaboration with the German university is federated learning which is the idea that all these edge devices in concert are learning together so that when one picks up some kind of strange piece of information, they in concert kind of learn from one another and, you know, spread the compute around around themselves. So that's, that's an interesting area that I think will, you know, result in, in addressing some of these shortcomings. Yeah, and I mean, at DeepLate, our whole reason for being uh, is because, you know, we believe that things like the size and uh, speed uh, and, and power consumption uh, of deep learning uh, is in, in and of itself uh, a bit of a challenge uh, for deploying at the edge. So our whole optimization uh, thesis is about being able to get those models into a form factor that you can deploy um, at the edge as well. Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up by echoing, totally agree with, with, mm-hmm. with um, uh, before um, all the other panelists. So like our, our view also is on, on this, these massive training is that eventually it'll become kind of like nuclear tests um, where you don't need to run them all the time, right? So, um, yeah. so, so when you're training your model, it's, it's something that you're gonna, you're, you're gonna train it once on these big giant cloud you know, computer and you're gonna push it, uh, you know, push it uh, to all of the edge devices 
Um, and then eventually to address model drift is, is when you're going to start to need to, to start to doing this, this federated learning. Um, and the, the, the key part of a federated learning is, is also it preserves privacy. Um, so that as the devices on, at the edge are, are learning to improve, they're sharing that improvement without sharing the underlying data. Um, and so, so, so that is the, the biggest shortcoming is that you're, you're right. It's like, how do you, how do you train and update these models? But there, there are, you know, work is on, is on the, on the way, uh, underway uh, for that. Yeah. I think another one is the, uh, just even the, the, the challenge we have today with the supply of, uh, of chips. Uh, and, uh, I mean, to me, that's, that, that's a huge leading indicator of what, what's happening. Right. And the, the sheer, uh, volume uh, of the hardware that uh, is being required to power all these devices. Uh, mm -hmm. That's telling us that uh, these devices, they're, they're looking for more intelligence, whether it's AI driven or just general processing. Uh, there's a, you know, a huge demand uh, and that demand uh, is going to fuel the need for applications to run on that hardware. Uh, and that's kind of where all of us on this panel kind of come in uh, to help make that happen. Uh, and also, you know, to my earlier point, if we can, uh, if we can use uh, and leverage the existing hardware that's out there, um, that can help at least in the short term uh, address uh, some of these challenges as well. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it looks like we are just about at time here. So we'll go ahead and wrap things up. I wanna just extend another huge thank you to all of our panelists, Nick, Probal, Sheldon, Kareem. Really appreciate all of you taking your time. And to all of our guests in the audience, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to spend an hour with us and learn more about Edge AI. So thank you again um, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.